Welcome to Sports Show Live, brought to you by Lotta Land. Here's what's coming up on the show. Yeah! I can do it, Gavin. Bring me with you. I'm, so, I'm, I'm ready. You got nothing on me, man. You got nothing on me, Gav. Jerk, man, is what Titanic. Jerk, what's happening over there? Jesus, Jeff, it's all happening here at the minute. After my soul staff, right? She's got the videolies out. She's standing there. She's ready for... He's only got himself a pen and paper, Jeff. What are you doing, Jack? Huh? <laughs> Judging by my snapsicles, which are pretty intense right now. Brilliant show lined up for you tonight. In part two, we're going to be talking to Gavin Hennigan. You saw the video there. He's into all sorts of crazy challenges. So we'll be talking to him in part two. But first, I want you to give us up for our first two guests, um, Chrissy McCaig and Andrew Trimble. <laughs> How's it going, lads? Good. Yeah, yeah. All good, yeah. Congratulations at the weekend to the two of you. The double treble. And you yeah. just scored a try, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you live 20 miles away sh- fr- from each other in Derry and you, you don't know each other at all. You're a GA snob and you're a rugby snob, so you've never actually ha- ha- crossed paths. I think we, we discussed this earlier. I think I'm the first Protestant you've ever met. Is that, <laughs> so, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but... Uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, Chris Henry was on the show last week and he said oh, you're no. called Dopey Sheep and you have to explain <coughs> this to him so you, you might hit us with it. Oh, there's just not a lot to it really, I'm just a little bit, um, bit dopey at times, <laughs> so sometimes I'm not paying attention. I forgot what question you asked there, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, there's a bit of that to me, alright? Okay, so a disappointing reason there, yeah, Chris Henry. Yeah, it's a shame, yeah. <laughs> so it was exactly what the name was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Demo is here as usual with the live studio audience. Yeah, look at this! This five is a lot. Look at him. And we want to hear from you tonight. So yes, we'll be talking gar, we'll be talking rugby, we'll be talking mad adventures, all sorts uh, of Gavin. So if you have any comments, throw them our way. Uh, if you're Protestant or Catholic, um, <laughs> chuck them in. Hashtag Sports Joe Live if you're watching on Periscope or just there on Facebook and we'll get through them. Uh, if we like your comments, we'll read them out. Back to you, Willie. All right, Christoph Demo. Right, competition time this week. All you have to do to be in with a be in with a chance of winning a month's free lot and credit is tag a club mate along with the name of this GEA and rugby star. Um, we'll call out the winners at the end of the show. So it's a pretty easy one, I think, with the clue. Without the clue, I'd say we'd, we'd all be struggling in here. Um, lads, I want to talk to you about a piece Joe Brawley wrote um, at the weekend. And he says in it, right? So he says, win at all costs is now the only thing that matters in professional sports. It has become an exclusive demand, obliterating every other part of life, obliterating the really important things in life, like building relationships, building a career, socialising, collaborating with other people, and of course, partying. In short, finding out who you are. Andrew, you're a professional sportsman. Um, Can you confirm or deny this? Joe is into a bit of hyperbole, but... There's, there's, there's an element of truth there, I think, um, um, but there's got to be a bit of balance as well. Um, no matter how, you know, how much you want it, how passionately you want it, or how driven you are, um, there's got to be a bit of balance in your life, um, family life, study, you know, a bit of you know, work outside, hobby, whatever it is. I think there needs to be something to balance it up. And for me, keeping myself busy outside of rugby is actually being quite useful as well. But when you get into rugby mode, I think you need to be single-minded and driven as well. So I think he's, he's, he's along the right lines, I think. Um, he's not far from the truth, but you just got to balance it up. The obsession thing there is kind of, you hear that all the time, you have to be obsessed, you have to, you know, dedicate your life to it, you know, to the point where, you know, other things in life become less important. Well, what happens when you get an injury or what happens when you yeah. get dropped? You know, you, gotta, you have to be able to cope with these setbacks and, um, you know, the best players cope with, or, or even just in inside a game if your first touch isn't good you know if it's if you drop the ball or miss a tackle first time you know are you going to dwell on that you have to be able to move on from that and um, focus on other areas of your game and that kind of you know being able to cope with setbacks I think I think that's something that's pretty useful and that mental strength to be able to do that is, is a is a skill as well right Chris you suppose at GA it's that little bit easier in that GA players have day jobs but at the same time like I remember I had a day job that I hated and I thought about football right throughout the day, you know? So some people have jobs that can distract them, but others don't as well. Like it can become 
all consuming. Well, well I suppose that's the flip side of it is as Greek footballers, yes, we do have jobs, but we're also among our supporters. We're amongst people that go to the games and watch. We can't really get away from it. Um, that's probably something you don't suffer from maybe as much, but it can become very, very mentally demanding. It's like uh, male, especially, I oh, suppose. I think, like, you know, if I walk down the street, um, someone we're talking to you about football or hurling, um, sometimes there is no getting away from it, um, which is the beauty of the GA2, I suppose. But uh, there is sometimes, you know, maybe if you've had a bad game or if you've a big game coming up, the last thing you want to be talking about is actually the, the actual game or, or like a bad performance or whatever. So uh, I would uh, I would say that the Gaelic players sometimes have it tougher, but it's certainly a prevalent enough theme. I think that has been addressed quite well by the GPA. There is like there is players struggling for balance. And, and I suppose that's just become, or that's just because the general expectations on Gaelic players now have just gone through the roof. Yeah, and I, I, like, I guess, I suppose, in a professional environment, that's your life. When you finish then in that professional environment, you have to be back into the real world and you have to be prepared for that. And I'm sure yeah. a lot of, I'm sure you are, you, you've studied, but I'm sure a lot aren't. I, I was reading some survey or something like 70% of rugby players worry about yeah. when to finish you know because you yeah. don't might so a lot of them might not have prepared for that yeah I, I think it's i think it's a healthy thing to to get prepared and you know to worry about it or be mindful of it is quite a, a healthy thing but at the same time you only get one opportunity to play rugby and make the most of it and i, I know for certain i'm not going to enjoy my second career as much as, enjo as I, I've, I've enjoyed this one <laughs> so sure of it yeah, yeah so like i want to make the most of this and you know i might i don't know might have a couple of years left i want to make the most of it and sort of um, you know what Chris is saying there about um, you know a small town, and there, there's times Belfast seems like a small town as well. And if you don't go well on a Friday night, you're walking out of your house on Saturday morning, hood up. <laughs> Everybody hates me. Everybody thinks this is my fault. So it's I think you always feel like a bit of responsibility for your supporters and the boy, the, the people that come to watch you play. And yeah. you know, there's that there is that connection with Ulster as well. Okay, but how do you switch off, Andrew? For example, because I know when I was playing for maybe the seven or eight months of the season, I wouldn't see a lot of friends I grew up with because they're out drinking and going out and they're going to gigs and they're going to weddings and they're going to like all that kind of stuff that I couldn't go to. And I found myself drifting from, from them for a few months of the year and I'd been knocking around with teammates and stuff. And then when the football season was over, I was back with other friends. It's weird, it's hard to switch off when you're knocking around with teammates on your time off. I yeah. don't know if you... If you uh, find that as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I would, I would. Um, it's it's nice to get a bit of balance there with with the teammates. I find on on match day because it's a, it's a stressful environment and you know it's kind of there's a lot of stake on a Friday night when you get out there and perform. If things don't go well, you know. I, I worry a lot about performance and I dread match day. Cause it just feels like the longest day ever when it, with a seven o'clock kick off that night. Right. And uh, I could be hanging out with my my wife and my friends and. They, my my wife thinks I'm weird. She thinks I'm odd on match day because I've just got this thing weighing over me. Whereas I go for lunch with my teammates and we're in it together. Yeah, because they we're understand. In it together, yeah, I feel like you know we we get each other. You know, and I'm kind of I'm normal with them. I'm I'm weird with my <laughs> wife. It's a strange yeah. kind of you know because we we sort of understand each other because we're in the same team. But that, but that's even the same. Say if you lose a big game, you don't want to talk to anybody. Only the fellas that understand what you're going through. Do you feel? Do you find that on nights out like that nobody else in the bar or anything really gets how disappointed you are outside of the fellas that are as disappointed as you. Yeah, and you know what? If you aren't suffering or you aren't feeling that way, you're probably in the wrong kind of environment because if you're going to play competitive sport, you've got to be prepared to suffer. And part of that suffering is the actual mental preparation before it. That's probably the most maybe the extreme part of it because yeah. at least when you're on the actual game, you can actually do something and you can put that energy into doing something, hopefully positive. But... Uh, I can actually relate to a lot of things that Andrew's saying there because, uh, you know, the bigger the game, the bigger the pressure, and the bigger the suffering. But once you get that elation of winning with your teammates after and that, you know, that embrace after that big victory for that, you know, probably 10 or 20 second gap, it's just unbelievable. And that's what you sacrifice, that's what you play for. But you, you've had the experience of the Saturday night games now, that's 7 o'clock wait. It say that is torturous. Can we're used to playing at two o'clock in the day? Like that's it. those extra few hours probably are. Are you as nervous as Andrew in the build-up? I'm surprised to hear you're as nervous as that. Yeah. Still in 
you know, in your career. Yeah, but I think you need it as well. Yeah. Like you need those nerves. The boys would say in, in, in Carton House when you're getting ready for an Ireland game, um, Monday, Tuesday training is really tough and it's stressful as well with, with Joe Schmidt involved. You kind of, you need to get things right or you're going to get a hard time. He's created an environment where the high standards are expected. So you get your day off on Wednesday and you're wrecked from Monday, Tuesday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is rubbish. Thursday, you get your session done and that's the one time in the week you can relax. Thursday afternoon, just take a breath, get in the Shelburne Hotel, get yourself a pancake, stuff your face all afternoon. And then, because you know by by um, <laughs> by Friday, you're starting to get stressed about Saturday's game. <laughs> so you've got like about a three hour window of the week when you can actually relax. The then... job rally's right, Chrissy. He's right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Joe, Joe's always right. <laughs> but do you find a seven o'clock game, like, because there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders, especially for slot nail, you know, like, so there's a lot of pressure on you, like you're the leader of the group. Well, like, you know, any time on a Sunday, it means you, you have the game hanging over you the full weekend. If you're playing on a Friday night, yeah. it's maybe arguably not as bad as having the game on the Sunday because Your the week's okay really. because you can actually train, but you can't really do much the Friday, Saturday before the game anyway, so you're just kind of waiting around for the game. I, w like, I think the Saturday night games are always the best because there's a greater atmosphere and then you kind of have Sunday free after it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would, I would tend to agree now that... But if you're in a, a, a successful team environment, you have so many, you know, like there's so many strong individuals, as Andrew says, you can kind of gain strength from being around them because you know exactly that they're going through the same emotions as you are. And there is a lot of strength that can be actually got from that. So, um, yeah, you can't be the most pleasant, you know, person around, you know, sometimes. Yeah. But um, after the game, I think, won or lose, you have to learn to accept and let go. Yeah, some, pe some people say, you often hear sportsmen saying that they get more nervous as they get older because they overthink things, whereas when you're young you just go out and play, you know, and you're a bit more carefree. Is that the case with you, or is it getting worse, is your condition getting worse? Uh, yeah, my condition, <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yeah, whenever you're young and kind of naive and you go out there and there's times, you know, I didn't even really, you know, I, I suppose maybe culturally it was different back then, there wasn't the same emphasis on detail and kind of knowing your game plan, you just went out and you had a little bit of a, a plan but it was quite broad and you just you know I just remember you kind of got the ball in your hands and you had to be go and maybe got an offload and you know you just, it was kind of, kind of like playing in the backyard you know, with your mates and now it's just it's intense and it's there's a lot of pressure and um, I suppose maybe you become aware as you get older you've got fewer opportunities left so you have to kind of yeah. make the most of them and that can work both ways because that can make you tighten up and want to make the most of everyone or it can make you relax and just say stuff it let's try and enjoy the sport that we grew up playing <laughs> So it's uh, it's always a bit of balance there, I think. Yeah, I think I always find with slack nail you enjoy playing. It never looks like you're o overly weighed down by you know not necessarily that you don't have tactics, but it looks like you're allowed to express yourselves and that there's a bit of enjoyment in the football that you play. Ah, there is, and I suppose that came from Mickey Moore and being at the helm. You know, um, Mickey Moore has been around a long, long time, but he's one of the most modern thinkers that I've ever had the joy of actually being under. Um, but he would never advocate like negative play. He would always say to go out and express yourself. And he would actually get a kick around training from actually watching us do things like that. And then that comes on to the actual playing field. But I don't think you can achieve anything in Gaelic football by playing that negative brand. It probably brings you so far. But I still think if you want to win big honours in Gaelic football, you've got to be able to play. Yeah. And you've got to be able to score. And I think this year we probably improved in that side of our game. I think just uh, finally, I think Joe Schmidt gets a bit, a little bit of criticism for that, in that his his tactics are very, very structured, and it looks almost like it's it's not really free flowing and, and off the cuff and expressive. It's a lot more tactical and set piece based and mm. structured. Where, you know, it's it's a bit far removed from Southern Hemisphere rugby, for example. It's, I, I think that criticism's reasonably unfounded. Is to it? Be honest. It's, it's been said a few times in the past. and It's not being good at the breakdown and being cover, yeah, hoping I mean, for penalties and you know, yeah. not necessarily offloads and that kind of you yeah. know, good, good I suppose the, the, the alternative is, is, is play the way France play and they just say, you know, just you know, throw the ball about and kind of you're, you're, you're all a bunch of talented indi individuals who go out there and play some rugby and they, they can't buy a win at the minute. You know, you've got to have a bit of structure and yeah. certainly I'm a big fan of that, knowing where you're supposed to be and kind of outsmarting the opposition and not just relying on you know, a talented um, out half or a couple of talented ball carriers, 
you go out there and 15 players and you become greater than the sum of your parts and I think Ireland definitely we've become a side that kind of makes the most of ourselves and beats beats teams together and does it um, in a team framework and that's quite satisfying to see that all to come, come together because there's a lot of rehearsal um, goes into place, there's a lot of hard work goes in there and whenever you see it come together as a team it's, it's quite satisfying I find. Yeah, no exactly. Come here, before we finish up um, there's a clip from the Connacht Club football final, I'm not sure if you had a game, well you had a game as well, um, not sure if you saw this, so this is the Castle Bar players coming out, they had to jump the wall to get out into the field because the game was in Galway. Here's, the, here's Cara Finn, the Galway team, the gates openly, magically open for them, <laughs> um, getting out. So like the, the Castle Bar lads, they're obviously big Mayo, uh, or big rivals, so here they are jump, having to jump the fence, which is actually disgraceful, two stewards there. The story behind this, Andrew, was um, Castle Bar came out four minutes before they were supposed to. Um, oh, come on, and you these can't two be coming out before. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Outrageous <laughs> stuff. So they were meant to be out at 22, which was okay, and they're out at uh, 36 minutes past and two stewards made a team um, preparing to come out into the field for a Connacht final, jump over, wall, jump over a wall. Like, I don't know if this happens in rugby, but I'm not surprised. I, you see stuff like that happening all the time. <laughs> Gia, Chrissy, you're shaking your head. It's an epidemic at the moment. The guys in the, <laughs> the, guys in the yellow bibs or the orange bibs need to be just completely removed because uh, like that kind of stuff there is just... It doesn't do... It's funny for us, but... It doesn't do any good for the GA because, like, no. that's a massive game for people there. Like, the, like them players have sacrificed a lot of time to be not laid on the pitch, and the pitch was a quagmire, anyway. Yeah. So I don't know what they were trying to achieve. Four minutes, like you jump over a wall there in long studs, and you could easily turn your ankle. You know what I mean? It's it's dangerous if nothing else. Yeah. But I don't know. It, maybe the tomb is like welcome to hell, Galatasaray kind of a way stadium. <laughs> you know, this psychological warfare. Demo, yeah, what's it, going on over it there? It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor. They could have just jumped into the, the tour bus and just rammed through. That would have been good, like an 80s movie. I've uh, got a couple of questions. Thanks so far for commenting in, people. Uh, Brandon asks, oh, like uh, from what you were talking about before, lads, uh, with the hood up and everything, I'm guessing, what was the worst and best time you were recognised out in public, if you remember any of those? Oh, I've had, I've had a number of times... Um, People have said, oh, jeez, Tommy Bo. Matt Bo-. Damon, no? <laughs> Matt Damon. <laughs> I would have been happier with Matt Damon. That was Tommy Bo. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, get, I get called Tommy Bo a lot. Really? Yeah, a lot. He gets Andrew Tremble, to be fair. <laughs> That's not a bad one. It's okay. Tommy Bo isn't the worst one to be compared to. What about you, Chrissy? Do you get you have any... Um... No, I, I don't think I'd be in the same, the same category as Andrew from being recognised now, but uh, I quite like it low-key. <laughs> yeah, nice. And one more question. Oran asks, uh, before a match, this is for both, uh, is there anything you do superstitious that, uh, before a match that you have to do? I got nothing. No. No, no it's... Uh, there, You're too that's... nervous to think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just don't speak to my wife. Um, on my don't speak to your wife? <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm, that's it. Mm, just <laughs> spend <laughs> don't spend yeah. time with the kids or the wife on match day. You got you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, probably just go for a meal with, with two or three of the boys before every big game, usually. Um, kind of cuts down the nerves a wee bit, so that's kind of became... A ritual? The night before? Yeah, usually, yeah we, we usually go away somewhere the night before, not too far away, obviously, and just have a meal out of the, out of the, out of the, out of the public eye. And uh, there's no football I thought you were going to say out of the training fund or something like no, that. No, no, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sort of a, uh, the motorway, like a chippy van or something, just like, yeah, we're going to win tomorrow. Uh, thanks for your comments. Keep them coming in. Hashtag Sports Joe Life if you're on Twitter or just there on Facebook. And, uh, oh yeah, it's Connor's sketches time. So now uh, Connor's going to throw to a soccer... So, oh, hang on, let me guess. Let me get this right. Gillette. Soccer Saturday. Oh, yeah. Soccer Saturday TV and movie review special. There's not much happening in Irish sport. So here we are today at Soccer Saturday TV and movie special. Joe McNan is watching Titanic. Joe, what's happening over there? Jesus, Jeff, it's all happening here at the minute. After the slow start, right, she's got the diddiolis out. She's standing there, she's ready for... He's only got himself a pen and paper, Jeff. What are you doing, Jack, huh? <laughs> okay, Joe McNan. Joe Brawley's watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Joe, anything to report? Well, Jeff, there's all sorts of commotion going on in the Kardashian household, right? Kendall and Chloe just found out Kelly doesn't know how to do her laundry. Like, you couldn't write this stuff, you know. Absolute obscenity, so it is, you know. Oh, K 
Kim's just in. I tell you, last time I seen a rear like that, Ruby Walsh is whipping it. It's absolutely huge. Sweet Sovereign Jays. That is getting quickly, right? Jack is hammering away over here, right? Hanging out the back of it. They're in the car, right? They are flat out. The two of them, right? Like two badges on a back road. This is serious stuff now. I Jesus, she nearly put a fist through the window, eh? And Ryle eh? Nugent is watching Fifty Shades of Grey. Ryle, fill us in on what's happening. Yes, Jeff, both sides going at it, hammer and thongs. They're really up for it. She's handling the tackle very well. Great ball control. We're in for an epic encounter. Oh! I, I've never seen anything like it in my life, Jeff, right? You know, your man Bruce Jenner has just walked in, right? He says, my name is not Bruce. He says, you can call me Caitlin from now on. He says, I'm a woman. He says, right? I tell you, you can totally forget about him as far as he's a man. You can totally forget about him. Joe McNam, what's happening on the boat? Joe. Ja! Jesus, Ryle, is she double jointed or what, eh? She very well could be, Jer. Well, if she isn't, she is now, I tell you that. He's setting himself up and gaining position. He sees the gap. I think he's looking for the offload. He's going around the back. He's no right to be there. Tommy Mo! Jesus. <laughs> oh, serious finish in that. She's almost by the boot, eh? Lockdown, could you tell us what's happening on the boat there? The ship fucking sinks, right? I'll be back in five. We'll be back after this break. <laughs> All right, great stuff from Connor Sketches again. Okay, competition reminder. All you have to do to be in with a chance of winning a month's free Lotto Land credit is tag a club mate along with the name of this former GA and rugby um, superstar. Um, and we'll call out the winner at the end of the show. All right, it's time for our next guest. Like I said at the top of the show, he's into some really crazy adventures and extreme sports. So please give it up for Gavin Hennigan. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, good, good. I, I, I just don't know how to narrow your whole <laughs> career and whole life into the time that we have. But before we start, we'll get a look at um, some of the stuff that you do. Judging by my snapsicles, which are pretty intense right now. Day 12 on the lake. Uh, I'm about well over 500k done. Conor McGregor on the boat there, yeah, uh, Gavin. Yeah, do my best Conor McGregor impression there. His older, scruffier brother. Yeah. <laughs> but come here, so that's just people watching that would say 49 days on a boat that yeah. was rowing across the Atlantic. Yeah. I think the picture of the lake was a lake in Serbia where... You, no, you're miles off. So Siberia. Was, oh, that's Siberia. <laughs> what was I talking yeah, about? Yeah, Lake Baikal. It's the deepest, the, uh, biggest freshwater lake in the, in the world. Yeah. So it was 700 kilometres in 17 days. Pull, 17 days. Pulling a, a 60 kg sled. And there, there's another one in, is it the Yukon Arctic um, Ultra Challenge? You did 300 miles in five days, yeah. minus 30 degrees. And the bit I nearly fell off my seat um, reading, only six hours sleep in the five days. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty out of my head there now and uh, <laughs> hallucinating sleep deprived. Yeah, yeah. Really? So, yeah. Yeah, you get pretty, you get pretty out of it. Like uh, uh, my past, like I, I did a lot of uh, alcohol and drugs, um, you know, but I've been clean and sober now for actually 15 years. But um, uh, I've never been that tripped out of my head um, when I was sleep deprived up in the Yukon, going through these like trails in the snow, and there's all this snow on the trees. And um, I was making out these shapes like I could see aliens at ray guns and T Rexes and cowboys and all sorts, you know. When but uh, whereas most people, are, most people are saying to themselves, like, oh, it's not, it's not real, it's not real. I was like looking at it going, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This That's is fantastic. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, <trying> yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing, you know, I as I said, I haven't yeah, done any, yeah. I haven't drank or taken any drugs in a long time, so I was kind of making the most of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> natural, natural. Yeah, natural eyes, man. Natural eyes, as well. But, but that yeah. thing, because like, I mean, you went into rehab when you were 21, and we'll just hit on that quickly. Yeah. And you know, you were now you started drinking heavily at 16, and then started taking crack cocaine, heroin, really heavy drugs. Yeah. Went into rehab, came out. Yeah. And almost killed yourself then after yeah. that so really really horrible uh, yeah it's a long time ago now you know but you know i did hit rock bottom at 21 you know kind of I, I i'd never finished school you know no no leaving cert no job uh, i didn't even know how to drive you know kind of real rock bottom ended up in a rehab and then not long after that uh, you know i i tried to take my own life a really botched attempt 
um, and, and that was all kind of like post rehab and like I was really dealing with like kind of the rawness of myself really like when you take away the alcohol and drugs you're kind of left with yourself and, and I didn't like what I, what I saw you know um, so you know I had that sort of episode then and I was very lucky um, I met a guy and we, we, we went surfing for the first time um, a couple of months after coming out of rehab and it was really from there that trying surfing and sort of being open up to that world of adventure that I sort of had a bit more purpose in life and it's kind of been like that for the last 15 years I've just been all over the world and focused on having as a good as a good a time as I can doing yeah. the stuff I want to do. Because these are extreme sports. When I think of extreme sports in my head, I think of adrenaline. I think mm. of like you're. These aren't really adrenaline. No. These are these are like <laughs> a form of self harm or something. I know. Yeah. Like, people <laughs> say to me. People say to me like, "Oh, you're such an adrenaline junkie." Like, and I'm like. Seriously, like rowing across the Atlantic is the most boring thing you could imagine <laughs> yeah. doing. Like it's like the same thing yeah. day in, day out. Like, you know, I spent four to nine days rowing across the Atlantic. People say to me, Oh, what did you see in the wildlife? And I'd be like, Yeah, I saw whales, dolphins, sharks, and like, oh amazing. But then they don't realise you mightn't see something for like two weeks, you know what I mean? Yeah, so like yeah, yeah. you know, like two weeks like you see like a fin of a whale and it's like for a second and that's it, and then like, you know, you might need to see something for another two weeks. So, so like so why do you do it then, I suppose, Kevin? Like, I mean, because that like you're painting a picture of it's a obviously an individual sport, and it's a lonely sport, and it's a dru grueling, painful sport. Yeah, look, I suppose it's just a challenge. Like, I mean, I didn't know how to row four years ago. I, I had an notion how to, how to how to row. Like, rowing across the Atlantic was the first race rowing race I was in. So I just I just you know came across this book. I read it, and I was really intrigued by the whole thing. And I just thought this is a, a challenge bigger than myself. And I just said I really want to take on that. And, and that's the kind of things that I've been doing. I'm just looking for adversity and challenges that are, are, are much bigger than me, and, and trying to. You know, get through them and conquer them, and that, and that's kind of what the 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 row was. You know, yeah, I obviously painted a picture that it was uh, tough and all that, and it was. But you know, it was an incredibly amazing experience, like to see fifty sunsets and fifty sunrises. You know, all you know, spectacularly different. You know, and, and sort of get through that that sort of whole experience and make it to the other side to that moment where we just saw there where I got uh, where I stepped off the boat. Like it was it was yeah. it was incredible. Like so I'll never forget that. You know, what's the downtime then, and the rowing one? What do you mean? Just what, like, oh. like when do you like? What's the sleep time there? Oh yeah, there was very sleeping? little sleep there again. Like I was sleeping probably three to four hours, so I was rowing up to sixteen hours a day. So it was a pretty Jeez. ridiculous schedule. Like and again, I wasn't as like I wasn't hallucinating as bad as it would have been in in, in the Yukon because I was trying to like not get into that sort of state. But I was, you know, when I when when I called my family now, they were worried about me because I was I was slurring a bit, you know, and stuff. So, um, but I did have a lot of support. Like I had a weather guy. Like he was telling me exactly what was happening with the weather. So I take away that decision making, you know, I just kind of had to do the basics, you know, and okay. then I had like a, my friend Henry at home who was like my technical advisor and he was just, he'd remind me of things I need to do every few days and stuff, you know, to keep the boat sort of uh, ticking over. It, maybe this is a stupid question, but is the fact that you've had a past in drugs and staying up for days on end, <laughs> is that any, like, I mean, your ability to be able to stay awake for and exercise? Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm creating a link here that shouldn't be here at all. No, no, it probably is. Like, you know, I, 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 I suppose there's definitely a, a bit of abuse there, you know, to some degree, you know, but I mean, um, you know, like addiction is a very sort of damaging thing, like, you know what I mean? And, and you know, when I came home, like I had this homecoming in, in um, in Salt Hill, and it was uh, like there was more kids there than there was uh, the adults. You know what I mean? So like I was inspiring a whole lot of young people um, in that. Like you know, so you know, I kind of be careful like what I say in regards to like abusing myself. You know, yeah. it's it, there's been a lot of benefit for other people in it, and, and I survived it. Like you know what I mean? It made me stronger it's as a, a person. Positive you know message. what I mean? It, there's positivity there. Like you know what I mean? For yeah. sure. Yeah. So come here. How do you practice? How do you train for this stuff? Like I mean, you live in Ireland, right? Do you have to go to these places first? It, like it's minus thirty. So mm. like it's a trek. So how do you prepare your body for that type of yeah, those conditions? Yeah. So like I've been on all these uh, cold adventures, and I've, been, I've spent a lot of time. Like I've been in Antarctica. I've spent a lot of time in Alaska, up in up in the Yukon. So like I do go away periodically, and like for this next challenge, which is the one in Alaska, I'm I'm going to do in this race called the Adidas Sport, which is a thousand miles, seventeen hundred kilometers, exponentially longer than anything else I've done. Um, I'm I'm going away at the end of December to train in America. It's part, actually a race. Like I'm going to use it as training. Okay. Um, and yeah, like I'd, you definitely have to get out. But look, training in the west coast of Ireland in the middle of winter in the in the in the piss and rain. Like if you can get through that, you can get through anything. Like you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not that shock. Like I'm I'm sure at minus thirty, like I mean you have to keep on the move. Yeah, so the way it works is like you'll, ha you'll wear a lot of gear, like, you know, I'll have like three, three sets of gloves on, um, you know what I mean, two or three pairs of socks, like, you know, you'll be layered up, um, but then you got to really watch because if you start to sweat 
uh, over sweat like then you stop it'll freeze so you, it, you actually have to stay on the side of being a little bit cold all the okay. time yeah you gotta be really careful because uh you know as i said if you you get you'll get frostbite very easily you know right okay and even on that lake then like i mean how are you mm. navigating across that are you do you need spikes like are you yeah so i had these uh things called ice spikes just like screws even the bottom of your of your runners um, and, and that gives you traction on, on the lake. But as regards navigation, it was pretty easy. You just follow the coastline uh, south to north, you know. So, okay. Yeah. And for those ones, who have you got with you? It's just yourself again. It's just. Yeah. So that was um, that. That particular one was a, a solo expedition, you know. So I, I went over there um, on my own. You know, I had a bit of logistics help on the ground because like nobody speaks English over there. You're talking. It's like. Uh, Lake Baikal is like six hour flight from, from Moscow, you know what I mean? You're way over by Mongolia and China, you know, like no one speaks English over there. It's the complete wild west, like um, everyone looks like Genghis Khan over there, you know, it's like full on like Mongolian like style. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like it's uh, it's wild, like, you know, but I, I mean, I was well prepared for that and I had all my supplies with me in the, in the sled. So I was, you know, I was, I was able to go unsupported for the, for the whole crossing, you know. Okay. So how, like, I mean, I don't know about this question, but how, how can you afford all this? Like, I mean, I'm sure this costs a lot of money. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm a diver, a commercial diver by trade. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I after I got clean and sober, I went out to, and I started surfing. I went out to Australia, like a lot of young people do in their early twenties. And I was working on building sites. And yeah, I got, they don't do I, the job over there. You no, <laughs> but then I got this. I got went to went to school for to be a commercial diver, and then I've been working as a deep sea saturation diver for the last sort of near, over ten years. So I go away for like periods of time, you know, especially in the summer, and work for like two three months at a time. Uh, make really good coin and then uh, blow my money on expeditions. Okay. Yeah. So that's a nice little routine you have <laughs> yeah. going there for you here. So just just to explain the the diving, the commercial yeah. diving. I was reading about this. Like, so you dive maybe two hundred meters down, yeah. and like you're fixing oil rigs and stuff. Yeah. Down there. So yeah, it's heavy construction usually on on like oil platforms. So doing um, uh, it's this thing called saturation diving. It's kind of hard to explain, but basically I live inside a chamber for like twenty eight days at a time. So you go inside this chamber, we get compressed to the, the same depth that we're working at. And then uh, we get inside like this thing called a diving bell. And then that takes us down to the bottom. And then we get out of there and go to work for like six or eight hours. Okay. And then come back up into the chamber and that's where we live. Like, so it'd be a team of three of us, you know, it could be more, maybe six sometimes. Um, and we spend like 28 days living in this chamber uh, and going up and down. But then at the very end, well, actually after three weeks, we do a decompression. So it takes, actually takes seven days. To decompress to back, back yeah, from that depth. It actually takes shorter time to come back from the moon than it does from those depths. Jesus. So, how, <laughs> so in the in compression chamber, they keep you down 200 meters for like, I don't know, how many days to get your body, u- to get, oh, get your body you, used you to it? You can compress very quickly, but it takes a lot longer to come back out. To come know? back so up, It only takes yeah. a few hours to compress, and yeah. then it takes like seven, as I said, seven days, about seven days yeah. to get out. Yeah. No, I've, uh, I've gone down 20 meters myself in Thailand. You nice know, one, so yeah. I know, I know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Ah, you probably saw more than me. Yeah, usually, yeah, you know, usually you, know, you like just have to equalize on the way back <laughs> off here. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, come here, talk to us about this new challenge. There's only 20 people in the world have ever have ever done it. Let yeah, it. so this, uh, so it's, the, uh, it's called the Adida Sport or the Idiot Sport. If if, if you want to uh, play on it, but it's the it's this race on the Adidarod Trail, which is this old historic trail that crosses Alaska from Anchorage to Nome on the Bering Sea. Now it's actually used by the Adidarod Dogshead Race, so it's a ra- that's a dogshead race that happens every year, and it connects all the small towns and villages through Alaska by this trail. Now. Alaska is a huge place and there's not, there's not a lot of roads so these towns they only get connected during the winter through this trail and the, the, the dog's head race brings a lot of um, you know, tourism and, and highlight to these, to these villages. So uh, I'm very much a sideshow to the dog's head race because I'm doing it on foot and not a whole lot of people do it on foot but there's a separate race and that's what we're, we're part of and people okay. also do it on bike and ski but very little people do it on foot because it's, uh, you know, it's an absolute mammoth challenge. It's 1700 kilometres, 1000 miles you know, across Alaska over the space of about a month. Um, you know, dragging the sled with all your spies in it, you know, and, oh and that's the reason why not very many people have finished. So when you say we'll be doing it, like what are the participation <laughs> numbers in sp- in stuff like this? And what, what is the, these are called ultra challenges, right? And like yeah, how like many people will be doing this? Uh, are at doing the ones you have done? Uh, there wouldn't be very many, you know, it's, you know, it's, I, I suppose it is an ultra marathon. It's, you know, there's it, ultra endurance challenge, I suppose. I don't know, it's a very, very, like it's the, the, the Adidas sport is, is probably, you know, the longest f- continuous foot race on, on, on earth, you know. Um, so there'll only, there'll only be a few people doing it. I think there's only going to be a handful doing, doing this. I, don't know, I haven't seen the start list. A lot more people will be doing it on bike, you know, those fat bikes. So, um, you know, that's obviously a better way to travel than on foot. Yeah, yeah. And you do, you do, you do some of these for charity as well, do you? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm actually national ambassador for Jigsaw. 
um, and so I'm raising money for the, for those guys. So you, so you can see more of the uh, jigsaw.e forward slash Gavin. So jigsaw is the national youth mental health charity, okay. um, and that's obviously very very close to my own heart because of the stuff that I went through as, as a young person. Um, you know, I was very lucky not to slip through the cracks, like you know. So um, it, there's a lot of help out there. There's 13 drop-in centres for young people aged aged between the age uh, 14 and 25. You know, so um, yeah, really trying to plug plug those guys through yeah. through the stuff that I do. And fair play to you. And give us the website again. Uh, jigsaw.ie jigsaw. forward slash Gavin uh, G-A-V-A-N for, for uh, donations and more information there. Okay, brilliant yeah. stuff. Well, it is 17,000 or 1,700 uh, miles across the... Uh, kilometers, kilometers. Thousand miles, yeah. Thousand miles. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, get it right. So, listen, anyone can give anything to help that out. That would be great. Uh, Demo, what's going on over there? Yeah, an awesome one. Oh, uh, a lot of before I go, no, before I go over to you, oh. actually, I've got that one wrong. Um, Demo heard that you're on the show and... Uh, he got all kind of excited thinking he could do it. So we sent him along to see um, Cuddy. Rightio, Damo here, and I've been inspired by Gavin Hennigan to take on the extreme. So I want to test myself to see if I have what it takes to be an Arctic adventurer. So I walked into South William Clinic and Spa to undergo cryotherapy. Maybe they call it cryotherapy because you end up crying because you freeze your fingers off. So I'm about to cryotherapy. What is cryotherapy? It's a very kind of latest technology in sports recovery. We expose your body to minus 150 degrees Celsius. So it's pretty hardcore, but it has lots of benefits. New clients tend to go in for maybe two minutes max, two and a half. Ooh. Some people get to three on the very first session. You're getting close to, to a kind of a, a frozen state, but you, you'll be fine. Yeah. I've never lasted three minutes at anything before. <laughs> Look at the size. <laughs> oh man, that's cold enough. Can I just do that? I'm not thinking about it. I don't. Even, I'm not even. I'm not even gonna think about it. Oh what? Look at me! I can do it, Gavin. Bring me with you. I'm. So, I'm, I'm ready. You got nothing on me, man. You got nothing on me, Gav. Yeah? <laughs> Probably the coldest I've ever felt. I'd say. <laughs> I can't remember ever being this cold before my life. Now, all done, just watch your set coming up. Look at that! <laughs> Listen to this! Oh, the gloves are frozen! My nipples are solid! It's full on. Like my toes, I can't feel them, can't feel below my ankles. And you think you could last two months in the Arctic? I've done about two months. I can do three minutes. Gabe, okay, I can do three minutes. Is that worth anything? Cryotherapy. Lovely up, Auntie. You call this cold? Lads, I do. Yeah. Two things there, you're in great shape, number one. Um, <laughs> number two, you're the happiest person who couldn't feel his ankles I've ever come across in my life. I know, I've got fake feet on now, these aren't <laughs> real anymore. But it was worth, I guess, like I was saying before, because your head's out, you're, st you're just watching your body freeze, but you're still warm here, so it wasn't too bad. And it was worth it just for the exit. How Star Wars was that? It was like, <laughs> dun, dun, It's like Han Solo coming out of the carbonite. But they, people do it to to help bruises and lose weight. I lost five inches. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was full on, but you know, that's three minutes. I don't know how the hell that trip. Imagine if they found a UFO that was frozen in the Yukon and you, were, you weren't tripping after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> don't know if believe me. You're yeah. not only ambassador for like extremes, but there's going to be so many like Howieers that are going to be like, let's go to the Yukon. <laughs> There's like five months, no sleep, five days. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great, mate. But yeah, a lot of adoration on online as well, of course, Gavin. We've got John Burke says, legend, Gav. Peter, uh, Peter O'Connor, well done, Gav. Ashley Martin says, man, Gav, ledge pants. <laughs> and uh, uh, a question, um, oh, here's one from JP. Have you ever been attacked by wolves or sharks or anything? That's what he says. Uh, any, um... No, I, uh, when I was in the Yukon, there was a, a, I was actually stumbling along one evening, uh, you know, completely out of my head, sleep deprived as I was, and I was seeing a lot of wolf uh, wolf tracks on, on this lake that I was on. And I was actually dying for sleep, you know, so I was going to get out my little bivouac and go for sleep. But I was really unnerved with all these wolf tracks, and I was just, 
you know, so I kept going anyway and I found a spot like this uh, that, that didn't have them. But I found out later there was all these markers for the trail and uh, they'd all been torn down and I apparently found out that the, the baby wolves to be playing with them. So they'd be, you know, they'd be biting them and stuff like that, you know. So, yeah, they were, they were really close. Like there was a pack very, very close in it. So you're, yeah. on your, so you're on a wolf path. Oh, Pretty lovely. much, yeah. Jeez, yeah, yeah, man, yeah, that, was, yeah. that was quick, man. Yeah. And uh, one real quick. So when you're rowing and then you stop, do you have to anchor down? And yeah, then, so and then how deep? How deep is the <laughs> deepest? Nah, look, if, if you had an anchor, it would, it's 5,000 meters, so you'd have, you'd, your, your, boat would, your boat would be weighed down with chain. So now you have a, what's called a sea anchor, so it's a big parachute, um, and you let that out, uh, out the front of the boat, and it would just kind of hold you in place, stop you getting pushed back. So oh, right. I also had an autopilot would keep me on track, so if I was getting a good push from the wind, uh, I'd, I'd be kept moving in the right direction, you know? Jeez, nice okay, one. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. But what if the what if the wind is going the opposite direction? That, right? I put out that anchor, and that would that would keep me keep me in place. Like yeah, okay. yeah, it would stop me getting pushed back. So I've had to, I had to do that a few times. Yeah. Okay, mm. that's interesting. That's mm. great. Yeah, yeah. And thanks, uh, thanks so much else? for your questions. No, no. I mean, there's a uh, we're running out of time, but there's a uh, there's there's everyone just saying fair play to you, pretty much. <laughs> 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 to sum it up. So well done, Gavin. Cheers, back to you. Fair play on the old hallucinating stuff there. I think that's <laughs> everyone's <laughs> impressed with that. All right, now it's time for the Lot of Land Knockout Challenge. Um, before we get into this. We'll have a look at the leaderboard. Yeah, so there's been huge movement on the leaderboard. Um, Paddy Houlihan's come in in first place ahead of Kenny Egan um, in a bitter feud between MMA and boxing. There's no bitter feud at all, and money making that up. Um, yeah, so that's the big movement last week. Up this week is Chrissy McCaig, um, and we recorded this earlier, so here's how it went. All right, so the knockout challenge is very simple. As you know by now, Chrissy, and you do know by now because you've seen this happen before, you've got three punches and we count your best score. Paddy Houlihan, as I've already mentioned, is on 9.09. He's gone to the top of the leaderboard. You're not going to beat Paddy Houlihan. Let's not fool ourselves here, Chrissy. But there's some GA, there's some <laughs> GA scores. <laughs> this, fella's, this fella's a point score centre back. He's not a fighter. I know by him straight away. Kieran Donaghy's on 8.85, Colin Begley's on 8.78, and Aidan O'Matney is on 8.39. There's some GEA ones that you can have a bit of a rivalry with, because yep. you won't be Pally Hooligan. Okay, let's get your first goal. Chris, you're going to have to up that. Now, there were some tactics last week. Paddy Hoolan ran from way back there, so I don't know if you want to try that. Okay, so let's give him a round of applause and we'll do uh, punch two, Chrissy. Let's see you. Oh, that's much better. That's much better. Chrissy, go number three. You've got Begley and you've got Donaghy to beat. Give him a round of applause again. That's good. You're going, you're going up anyway. You're on the way up. Okay, so the middle one worked. First two kind of uh, scraped them a little bit. But Chrissy McCaig scores eight, four, two or six. We'll check it out in the studio. <laughs> I'm still not sure what the score was. Was it two or six? Six. Six. <laughs> two, four, six. I'm not sure about that now. It's definitely two. Demo competition winner. It was too hard this week again. Uh, no one got it. Nobody got it. No and nobody got, got, it. got it last week. No, and it All was, right. uh, no, Mick Galway there. It was Mick Galway. It was difficult, but I thought the clue was really, really, made it really, really easy. Did you know that, lads? No. What was the clue? Did you not? No. <laughs> <laughs> the clue is that he's an XGA, an ex rugby uh, star. Too late, we all know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Stop trying to try it now, Gavin. Um, right, listen, that's all we have time for. Thanks to all our guests, you've been absolutely great. Thanks to the crowd, thanks to Demo, and thanks to our spotter, sponsors, Lotta Land, helping you dream bigger on new Euro Millions with lines for only two euros. And we'll see you next week. Good luck.